I'm Lou Brutus. For my next guest, we go to Australia, where it is currently 7.45 in the morning on January 26th, 2001. No, something like that. Winston McCall <laughs> of Parkway Drive. It's good to see you again. How you been? Uh, I've been all right, man. Good to see you, Lou. It's been a, it's been a fair while. COVID's done an interesting thing to us, huh? <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and my understanding is uh, you guys are having a pretty rough time of it right now in Australia. Yeah, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's interesting. We're just, everyone's dealing with it different ways in the world. And yeah, it's just interesting times for the band, man. Like it's, it was, it was the kind of thing where it's put everything, I don't know, it bought, it, uh, yeah, it's been a challenge. And it's been a challenge in terms of like, for us as a band, um, it brought to the surface basically 20 years of us uh, maybe not having the best mental relationships with ourselves and each other. And um, all of a sudden, when it came time to go back on the road, we were like, whoa, hang on. There's some things we haven't addressed here. And they're actually far more damaging than you actually realized because you were constantly touring and just pushing everything under the carpet. So that's kind of the, the heavy thing for us. So amongst actually getting COVID itself and dealing with the other stuff, we've just had yeah, some some work to do in the band before we hit the road again. Uh, so we chose yeah, to do that instead of like the band exploding. <laughs> really? which, which takes us to this past April and the release that you guys did, which at first when I started to read it, like my heart skipped a beat. I'm like, they're breaking up. Mm. No, they're not breaking yeah. up. What's going on? So uh, yeah. again, you've already hit the surface of that, but tell me, any changes that you guys are making as to how you operate as a, a group of human beings yeah, stuck in yeah. buses all the time to keep from driving each other nuts. Well, that's it. Exactly. Like it's, it's the thing for us is like, we've done this for 20 years and it's been a really, really tight knit unit. Like the way we did everything was basically the band grew. And as it grew, we didn't bring in anyone from the outside. We just took on more and more responsibility. But at the same point in time, we took on more responsibility personally and just tried to hold it up as these individual pillars and it became less relatable as people. And at the same point in time, it became very isolating, also very hard to share anything with each other. And the whole aspect of this survival mode of being in a touring band, like it's still really isolating existence. And it wasn't until we got home and had this forced time off during COVID that all of the, the mental, I'm gonna say damage, that had been caused uh, kind of came to the surface. So we came to start touring again and we sat down and started talking and we're like, whoa, there's a whole bunch that we haven't said to each other that we've gone through over the years that is like, that has pushed each and every one of us to breaking point, which we never actually realized we were there because we never talked about it. Like mental health gets very well rolled under the carpet, especially here in Australia. Um, and we, we literally had to have a frank conversation and go, if we go back on tour, what is going to happen? And the consensus was like, we might get through the tour, but it's probably going to make us never want to be in this band again. And the band will break up. So we're like, okay, what's the, what's the alternative? Like, if we want to keep being in this band, what do we do? So for us, it was like, okay, we got to do the mental work. We got to go and seek help from people who specialize in this as a band and individually. And we've got to look at how we run this band and make it sustainable basically. So we can enjoy what we do to the maximum amount and make sure the audience and our fans get the justice of that. Because in the same, in the same time of saying this, I've watched plenty of friends bands go through similar things and explode and not come back from it. And we're like, we don't, we don't want that to happen. We love doing this. Like there's a reason we put the work in, but at the same point in time, we just never stopped doing like the things that kind of made it a bit toxic, to be honest. So we thought we'd be frank with the audience and with the fans and the way we put it out there. Um, but it's obviously, it's just something that comes as a shock to people because you, you, you know a thousandth of what's actually going on behind that show that you see on stage or the, or the record you hear or the songs you hear, like what's actually going on in our personal lives and what has shaped half of our existence as people is a very unique and different experience, no matter that intimate connection you make through the music. So yeah, challenging one. 
<laughs> you know, I think this is one of those things where people don't understand uh, or sometimes have difficulty understanding, partly because they just want their favorite bands to always get along. And when you picture a mental picture of your favorite band, you're thinking, oh, they're off someplace having fun or they're in the <laughs> studio banging out songs. What are the types of things that make being in a band a long time sort of a, a, a tough road to hoe at times? Well, so to put it in context, like the youngest member of this band started when he was 16 years old. So we've been doing this for 20 years and the growth that any person would have between the age of 16 and 36 is absolutely mammoth. And you, then you, you throw into that uh, an environment where at no point in time is your future ever stable. Like you, you look at this as something which will be snatched away at any point in time because of injury, band politics, something else like a vice that comes along to do with anything to do with the music industry in general, which is notorious. Um, the relentless nature of what you have to do, like there's no off day with anything you do, even when you're at home. The isolating situation of like you, you have very few people in the world who can genuinely relate to what you actually do. Um, and the living quarters that that comes with, like even the concept of a bus in itself, like it, it'll take you 10 years to get to, but even then your sleeping, your sleeping arrangements are with the same 10 people in a bed that's literally the size of a coffin. Like you have a roof above you, like it's the same dimensions as a coffin <laughs> on a rolling bus where you're, you go to sleep and every turn you take on a bus, you think, oh my God, is this turn too steep? Are we about to crash and die? Um, standing on stage, like the show is fantastic. It's fucking terrifying to play. <laughs> sorry for this, sorry for the swearing, but when you get to this point, like, yeah, it's, it's just a very, um, it's a demanding, uh, profession and at the same point in time it's one that's very hard to to connect with anyone outside of the industry with like even our closest friends are like you don't quite get it and our closest friends do go man touring just looks like the best fun and you're like oh it is but there is so much work in that like i'm just not out there at this party no one in this band it's, it hasn't been a 20-year party it's been a 20-year um work in in progress that that never ceases that's the thing um, and it's just, a, yeah, it's a, it remains to be that, but it, even the bands, I think, fail to acknowledge that. <laughs> you know, touring to me sounds a bit like the way I describe New York City to people who have never been there. It's simultaneously the greatest place in the world and the shittiest place in the world all at the same time. You know? <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, you know, against this backdrop, you've got band has been together 20 years. We love each other, but we're also ready to rip one another's hearts out. So you've got that going on. That's against the backdrop of global pandemic, Australia shut down, not shut down, COVID, death and sickness everywhere. I'm, I'm not being a wise ass here. Out of that kind of a background, I'm thinking maybe the best album of your lives could have come out of it. So... Tell me about, <laughs> tell me about the music because again, I, and I've had the conversation so many times the last couple of years throughout history, some of the greatest art, painting, films, music have come out of the most horrible times in human, in human history. So how, how did you guys come out of this with new music and, and how are you feel? Yeah, man. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Like it's a, the crisis crisis does that because you know. it's the outlet. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it's been an interesting time in regards to new music. Like it's, um, I'm not going to say it was, it's been easy creating like any of it, but at the same point in time, it's been a very good outlet. Um, and it's been something to challenge frustration through. Um, what we have, what we have coming, I'm incredibly proud of. Um, and it's the kind of thing where we kind of, we got to creak the door open with all of this stuff in terms of like, you, you kind of get a, a glimpse at the vision before we release the entire vision in terms of singles and everything like that. Like, I'm not quite sure if anyone's aware of what's coming around the corner for this band um, sonically, but it was, it's been a really interesting process um, putting any kind of music together. Like being in Australia itself was 
has been an immense challenge in terms of writing. Like we, we've gone through lockdowns and all of this crazy kind of stuff, which just put um, different limitations on how we could even create. Like when you're in the middle of a, a like rolling lockdowns and infections and stuff like that, we had um, like our, our guitarist, who is Jeff, who's our part of the primary writing group, like he's got two very young children who can't get babysitters and we can't get time to produce in his studio. And at the same point in time, all the frustration of what he's trying to create is getting poured out into the new music that we're creating and everyone's in a really, really dark place. And this is, it's that thing of catharsis to a degree and, and trying to deal with the, the darkness in, in the way that we know how, which is, which is sonically, which is the sonic outlet for all of it. Like it's, it's really strange because I, I constantly wait for like our music to show the ray of light um, and like next next album, like we'll be in a better place and it, it will be a, a lighter record. And um, <laughs> the more I think, I think the more life goes on, the more I'm realizing that um, the older we get, the more, the more you realize it doesn't get lighter. You just get more information and more of a reality check on what life actually is. And then that gets reflected in, in darker art. So the art is dark. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm reminded of the, uh, I'm reminded of the old saying about life. It gets worse before it gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've heard something similar to that, but I haven't heard that exact poem. But yeah, yeah man, that's it. That's yeah. it. And it's interesting because I don't think it's—I don't think it's necessarily worse. I think it's just like the the more you you grow, the more you understand the the concept of the innocence of youth, um, and the ignorance of youth to a degree. Like your brain just doesn't have the capacity to comprehend everything that's going on. And the more you comprehend it, the more you're like, man, this is like you get the tools, you grow the tools to comprehend it and to deal with the, the, the weight and the darkness as you go. But, but it's, it's very, I think when we're younger, we're taught like the grass will be greener. There's a ray of sunshine on the other side of the clouds or whatever. And rather than just like, maybe it's cloudy and you've got to appreciate the fact that there will be clouds. Like, I think the thing that's kind of come from all of this for me is like, I've lived for, for a very long time in the dark and been afraid of the dark but after a certain amount of time you learn to get night vision <laughs> you learn to realize that like seeing things through a lens of darkness is i mean you see the beauty in it and if you don't put the effort and you don't adjust your eyes to it you miss out on a lot of it as well and it's fine it's fine living like that <laughs> if you would give me some insight into glitch because to your point mm -hmm. about the album having sort of a dark vibe to it. The first thing I thought when I heard it, I, I didn't want to say, I wouldn't say doom and gloom, but there seems to be, I, I would say probably sense of foreboding. Yeah. That makes sense for this? Yep. 100%, 100%. Like it was, it was the, the combination of like musically wanting to marry um, the lyrical content um, to something which was not only like, we always try and marry, I think, beauty and accessibility and melody to these the, the darkness, which is actually there in the first place. And all of the, the darkness comes from the lyrical concept itself. But like the basis for this song was the original, like the first riff you start he hearing on the, the song, which is quite intense in itself um, and quite relentless. But the, the lyrics were like they're they're about night terrors and nightmares and sleep paralysis which is a, a terrifying concept in itself like anyone dealing with that knows to be at the power of the darkest place of your mind and literally be paralyzed is a is a terrifying concept is a, it, it's a terrifying to feel um and the entire psychosis kind of feel that goes along with that of this altered state of reality being at the being at this place where your worst fears completely control you to the point of physical like physical paralysis is um i mean it's fascinating at the same point in time it's um it's complete and sheer dread um so when we were creating the song it was that marrying of like 
there's beauty in the melodies, but at the same point in time, we wanted this song to have that foreboding, rolling, twisting kind of feeling as it goes into the the release of the the end of it, basically. And that's how the the structuring of it went. And um, we thought it, yeah, it was kind of like the best doorway, like I said, into the rest of the journey, which will be coming down the track. But that's how that's how Glitch started out, basically. And it's kind of how it ended. We kind of just played around with these concepts until we got the right amount of like, this is a trip out and this follows the the journey of the trip. But at the same point in time, you kind of have to get hooked by that earworm. You bring up a great point because you could write the greatest lyrics and, and get the, the, the really most insane, cool sonic textures. But unless it's a catchy song, a lot of people aren't going to hear it, you know? So how do you yeah. take all these sort of dour, bleak things and turn them into like, hey, this is really doomy and gloomy and I can tap my feet to it, you know? It sounds yeah, silly, man. but th those are serious things. 100%. And that's something which we've like, we, we realized quite a long time ago and it's been a massive part of the art form which we do because for us, it is about connection. Like we, we latch onto melody um, as much as lyrics within this band. I'm going to say like 50, it's 50, 50 in the sense of um, members of this band being the people who are like, I don't even hear the words and people who are like, I completely connect to the words and that, and that is what latches me onto it. So we take both of the things into account. And for us, we want to make like a connection with people listening. Like it's the, the lyrics have always been important to me, but we are 100% of the mind that, at the same point in time, we want people to like, we want an earworm. And the thing for, for, for me as a lyricist has always been, I I get a lot of joy out of the idea of creating an earworm that has just as much finesse in terms of the way it packages an unpalatable or a, um, a darker element in terms of what this band has, which might not be seen as possibly accessible and and packing that inside something that's beautiful or hooky or catchy in a way that's undeniable <laughs> which is a really it's a really interesting um equation to put together as a band and that's something which is is kind of always there for us and that's a really like it's a really it's a fun challenge to do because you lean too far in either way and you lose the power of either of those elements and it kind of vanishes so being able to juggle those to create something which um, is memorable is a, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a unique thing to deal with. And new album is all done. Yes. She's done. Yep. Okay. <laughs> She's done. It's uh, like, it's, it's um, not sure if there's an announcement out about it or anything now, but yeah, it's um, where we're at with it. We're really, really, really happy. So you like, you don't ever get to hear something from Parkway unless it's, it's ready. A, it's ready that's the thing like it's where when it's very hard for us to be one of those bands that's like here's a single that is completely devoid of any context like when we create something it's a it's a like it's a world and it comes from the time and space that we're living in in terms of it's, it's not a it's not a fleeting moment it's something which is, we've been immersed in for a very large period of time and this is like this is capturing that large area of time and putting it like putting it to music which is is the soundtrack basically is the soundtrack to this part of our lives so give me a timetable for record and when and how much do we get you in the states um oh when it, i can't even remember release date the record is definitely out this year you're going to be hearing you're going to be getting more info coming up like the way things run, you get the drip feed. That's the thing. As much as I want to give you all the details as well, I'm like, shit, I don't know what I'm supposed to be saying here. What I'm not. <laughs> but like, if you've got a single, you know there's more coming, put it that way. Um, and it's not far off. Uh, and we, uh, God, when are we supposed to be back in the States? We're coming back. Definitely put it that, put it that way. We know like you cancelling a tour for us is not something where we're like, oh, yay we get yeah. to not go to america and like that was the first tour back for us like you know how much it sucks to cancel the first tour after three years of not touring like yeah we're, we're coming back i just can't remember the exact dates of 
when it actually is and it's going to be as quick as we can basically so yeah <laughs> we'll get them posted and i can't wait to hear the rest of the record and uh, it's always great to speak to you winston i do have one more thing for you if i may that has nothing to do with music you always may Lou. send it at me <laughs> all right here, here we go now last week here in the u.s I, I don't know if you saw the news or not there were congressional hearings about ufos and unlike a lot of the other governments around the world the united states um never really allowed commercial and military pilots to report strange things they had there was always you know I've risk been following to it, man. Been following it. so uh my question would be uh have you ever seen anything in the beautiful pristine southern skies of australia that you thought well that was pretty weird yes Tell straight me up have, which was a complete like it's so strange because for so many years it's, it's always that one of those things where you're like ah oh, i wonder if they're real i wonder if i ever saw something um so this was only like uh, it would have been four or five years ago we have really clear skies in our town really yeah, really yeah. clear um very minimal light pollution. And I was absolutely just, I was sitting outside looking at the stars um, and I was watching what I thought was a satellite move across the sky. Um, and I watched it for, it would have been a couple of minutes. They go really slow and I just kept keeping track of it. And then it got to um, a point and it started to slow down. And I was like, oh, this is really weird. Maybe it's an airplane. And then it became incredibly bright to the point where it was like, it was blinding. Like I had, I was like, whoa, was this a camera flash going off? Just like intense, this really bright blue flash. And I was like, that, I did not expect that. That's really strange. And then it picked up speed and slowly began to turn towards the Northeast and then just raced off like yep. in the distance. <laughs> so it changed directions and speed. Yeah, directions and speed in a way like, and this is something that was the size of what a satellite would be. And after this, this flash of light, and it, it was something which happened to the point where I was like, I can't understand what the entire second half of that journey, after I realized this was not a satellite, was i just really cannot explain it like we i'm very used to the flat paths that, that the planes come in like I've, I've watched planes my entire life i'm fascinated by them i know the landing lights i know the way they come in over our town everything to do with that and there's this is there's nothing that i could put these actions down to like absolutely nothing and i, I walked in to like our house guests and my wife and i was like you i just saw a ufo and everyone just kind of giggled and i was like i'm not I'm not joking here. Like, this is really funny, but a fully just sorry UFO. <laughs> like, what the hell? Which is, yeah, man, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And then, and all of a sudden, all of this stuff starts coming up. And I'm like, not really shocked because, like, it kind of, since, since the, they've shown all these videos and stuff and it's been verified, I'm like, kind of makes sense with a lot of the things, like, with this thing that I saw in relation to those things that are coming out because the speed at which this moved away from me. I've never seen an airplane move like that. It's the kind of thing where you, it's like watching a mouse move across the screen of a computer in the sense of you like, you track it. But in reality, that would have been like, I don't know how fast that thing was going, like thousands of miles an hour. If it, like whatever it was, was going thousands of miles an hour. And previously it was going slow enough for me to think it was a satellite. So there's two very different ranges of motion. So yeah, UFOs, whatever the hell is going on with, with them at the moment, I'm, I'm really fascinated by what comes out. I really hope we, we know something about this because either way, we're going to be dealing with the government going, hey, you know what? You can actually fly to New York in half an hour if you want it on a, on a Tic Tac, or it's like aliens and time travelers. Either way, all of this stuff is really interesting. <laughs> Well, there, there you go. Now, now, you know, hopefully there'll be some sort of disclosure, but also maybe there's an album in here further on down the line. <laughs> hey, uh... didn't Tom DeLong do like three of these albums? Oh God, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I got to sit down and I got to yeah. sit down and talk to that guy someday about this stuff. But yeah, right on that. And by the way, I, I've asked this question several times to people and some have given me interesting answers, but I think that was 
the best. That was really interesting. And uh, yes. Winston, it's always great to talk to you, usually about music, but UFOs as well. And uh, can't wait to see you here in the States again. I, I wish yeah, you well. Man. Can't wait to be back. Thanks so much, Lou. Appreciate it.